Hello, Robert Bastian here of Laryngopedia and Bastian Voice Institute. Uh, recently I went through a move and whenever a person moves they ten tend to thin out files and, and such and so in the course of doing that I found this old cartoon, 30, 40 years old. The backstory is that back then I used to give a lot of talks to uh, voice professionals. I would give a talk at a local conservatory to the voice majors, musical theater people, the uh, acting group, even voice teachers at national conventions. And in the course of my uh, presentations, I often introduce the idea that prevention is much better than, than treatment of uh, injury. And so I would say things like, it's better to build a fence at the top of a cliff than to park an ambulance at the bottom. And as I recall, I had two different cartoons. One was of a car on a mountain, curving mountain road, and the other was this one that I found uh, a few weeks ago. So it's this one that I, that I want to show you now, so let me just take you to the cartoon, and it's for your amusement, and it might even help you somewhat. So I begin with the idea that there is, are ways that we are protected from vocal injury. Common sense is a large knoll that keeps us from falling off the cliff and vocal education. Common sense, I know intuitively that to scream and yell for hours in a party, at a rock event, uh, in a rodeo, it just, I mean, I can do a lot with my voice. I can be pretty active and pretty loud and pretty vocal, but there comes a point when common sense says, you know what, it's enough, I better, I better stop, I better go somewhere quiet or, or whatever. <coughs> There's education about the voice, uh, so when we look at pictures of the vocal cords and see the tiny little blood vessels, the wetness, the mucus, and so forth, just knowing about the voice and how the vocal cords vibrate can be protective. There are images in your, our heads that just without our even thinking about it, they're kind of protective. Then there are people in our lives who are looking out for us, primarily voice teachers, but it could be a colleague, a friend, it could be a parent, uh, who are just kind of giving us little cues. You know what, you're, you're pretty loud on the phone or, or whatever it is. So those are sources of protection from injury. And uh, then as we go along, we don't just educate about the voice, but there's education of the voice. So it's not just pictures in the head, but it's personal physical knowledge of how the voice is produced. And so in that process, you learn how to produce voice safely, and that's protective from injury. So you build these fences of pr protection. You learn about vocal hygiene, wetness, hydration, you learn about acid reflux, which afflicts a small percentage of singers, uh, burns the throat at night when they sleep, acid comes up into the throat. Uh, voice production, how to produce the voice safely, even by making big sounds, you can do that safely or not safely. And then we learn the signs and symptoms of swelling, which are initially often thought to be just technical, but they are in brief, loss of high soft singing, uh, the day-to-day -day variability, I become a less consistent singer. Uh, we develop uh, increased effort. I can produce the voice very well, but I have to push a little bit. There is reduced vocal endurance. I go to a party, I sing a performance, I do a rehearsal, and I'm a little husky or tired. I become vocally fatigued more easily and then there's onset delays, and those are all found on Laryngopedia. You can read about those to a greater extent. <coughs> then, every singer especially, I think, should learn what we call vocal cord swelling checks. So I'm depicting that here as the final safety net. You've blown through these fences of protection, and now you need the very last thing that just won't let you fall is vocal cord swelling checks. And so there's a video I produced that explains those swelling checks in great detail. And I hope you'll take a, a look at that as well. So if we use our swelling checks and we detect swelling very early, the ladder that we have to climb up is short and easy. Early res response ladder 
uh, is so easy compared with if we don't pay attention to all of these things that I've mentioned and we now have a chronic injury, we're, we're down in the water, we're wet, we're, we're swimming around, we're getting cold, the ambulance is coming and oh my goodness, that's gonna be expensive and you know, it, it just is so miserable to have truly fallen off the cliff with something like nodules or polyps or, that, or, or a more chronic kind of swelling. And so to depict the idea that recovery is more difficult, I've drawn a long ladder. You can see it's, it's a lot of steps. It takes a while <coughs> to climb that ladder of rehabilitation. And the ladder, you'll see, is made out of the same thing that the fences are, are made out of up here. And <coughs> so we just patiently climb that ladder, and most of the time we can recover on our own but I've pointed out here that surgery must be an option. Uh, it's for what we call otherwise irreversible injuries. <coughs> we do the surgery as a last resort, not because it's not safe. It's a wonderful option, extremely safe, remarkably voice restoring on a time after time after time basis if it's done well. So you have to find a surgeon who's done a lot of this kind of surgery and can deliver that original equipment result that is, is not guaranteed but is pretty routine uh, only when necessary. So there you see it, the, uh, the idea of avoiding injury, uh, not falling off the cliff. If you trip a little bit off the cliff, try to, f to catch it early using the swelling checks and uh, so there you have it. I hope that's been amusing to you or again a little bit helpful and thanks for listening.